What do a billionaire, entrepreneur, teacher, and janitor all have in common? Well, despite vastly different incomes, education, and backgrounds, they all amass fortunes of millions and sometimes billions of dollars by investing using the seven characteristics all highly successful investors share in common. And you can too. So let's dive in. What's up everyone? Matt from Family Money School here. First up, successful investors think in decades, not years. Stocks and mutual funds typically report performance in quarters and years. And while you can find reports of two, five, and 10 years, they are definitely not emphasized. This is super deceiving because stocks have good years and bad years. If you only look at one year, you might be tempted to sell a stock or index if it's had a down year. But I mean, over long periods of time, the stock market has always gone up. True investing greatness isn't seen in months or years. It's seen over decades. Yikes. Investing isn't nearly that scary. In fact, over the last century, the stock market has averaged 10% every year. Now, there have been some years where there have been massive losses. But even with these losses, over the long term, you can reasonably expect an average return between 5 and 8% for a portfolio of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. If you stay the course and hold your investments over the long term, you will do very, very well. In fact, with an 8% return, your investments will double every nine years. And that's without contributing any more new money. Savvy investors know that the key to long-term success is investing new money in high quality companies over a long period of time, and then reinvesting your returns and dividends. Next up, great investors all honestly determine their risk tolerance and they stay the course. Now, flourishing investors understand that there is risk involved. I mean, there are no guarantees that the asset you bought will actually go up in value. In fact, there's a risk that you won't make money at all, but that you'll actually lose it. Certain investments like stocks are riskier than others like bonds. Stocks come with a much greater chance that you'll lose money rather than make it, especially in the short term but they also have a bigger potential payoff. Now, bonds generally move in the opposite direction of stocks, and they tend not to fluctuate as wildly. But keep in mind, with greater risk comes greater potential reward. Now, one of the keys to wise investing is to determine your risk tolerance. You know, just like some people prefer the merry-go-round to the mind-bending and stomach-dropping, loop-to-loop, corkscrewing madness of a roller coaster, not everyone enjoys the ups and downs and uncertainty that come with riskier investments. Your comfort level with the uncertainty that you'll make or lose money is called your risk tolerance. And in order to choose the right investments for you, you need to understand and be honest about what you're comfortable with. If you take on more risk than you feel good about, I mean, you'll end up making foolish choices with your investments when their value swings up and down. Are you sure you're okay with investing entirely in stocks? I mean, the market can move up and down quite dramatically, and there's the possibility that in the short term, you will lose money. I love stocks, and I'm totally fine with a little bit of risk too. I mean, since I'm not emotional, a few swings in what my investments are worth here and there won't rattle me a bit. I can't afford to lose any more money. Sell everything now. Bottom line, you'll act not out of intelligence, but out of fear, and you will lose money. Now, savvy investors honestly assess their risk tolerance, and they also understand how to get more potential reward from higher risk investments while actually minimizing the risk. Just like you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket, you shouldn't have all your money in one place either. It's bad news to have all of your money invested in a house. And it's not wise to use all your savings to buy as much stock of your favorite company as you can afford. Diddle for selling every asset you have and buying Bitcoin in the hopes of striking it rich. Because in each of these scenarios, the investor's portfolio, which is just their collection of assets that they own, is lacking diversification. Diversification seeks to spread out your assets over different areas that will all react differently to the same event. So when it comes to diversification and investing, this means spreading your money out over different types of industries, countries, and types of investments like stocks, bonds, or real estate. 
And a great way to achieve diversification is by using index funds. An index fund is a group of stocks or bonds designed to follow a benchmark index, like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. Inside of the fund, which can be a mutual fund or ETF, an exchange traded fund, you own a tiny bit of every stock on the index. So if you bought an S&P 500 index fund, you'd own a small slice of Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Home Depot, and even Disney. Even savvy institutional investors from Warren Buffett to Nobel Prize winners advise everyday investors to choose index funds. In fact, it was Buffett who said the best way to own common stocks is through an index fund. By spreading out your money over several different industries, countries, types of investments, time periods, etc., you won't fully eliminate risk, but you will definitely minimize it. And minimizing risk is a critical trait that all successful investors share in common. So then how much should you have invested in stocks? Well, a general guideline is that as you get older, stocks generally become a less desirable place to keep your money. If you're young, you have decades ahead of you to ride out any ups and downs in the market. But this isn't the case if you're retired and reliant on your investment income right now. A good rule of thumb to operate on is that you should have 110 minus your age in stocks and the remaining assets invested in bonds. So for me at age 40, give or take, that would mean I should have 70% of my investments in stocks and 30% in bonds. If you're comfortable with a bit more risk though, increase the percentage of stocks that you own. If the market ups and downs make you a little bit more nervous, increase the percentage of bonds in your portfolio. Then once a year, rebalance back to your predetermined percentages of stocks and bonds by selling whichever had a better year and buying whatever was lower. By rebalancing once a year, you can ensure that you will always buy low and sell high, and you'll be able to do it without having to spend hours studying the markets. Successful investors don't chase the hype or listen to the fears they tune out the noise. I mean, you've all heard the old saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And when it comes to investing, successful investors know that if it sounds too good to be true, it almost certainly is. Or it's a flat out scam, or it's crypto. I mean, either way, don't learn this lesson the hard way. Remember that you're investing your money, not someone else's. If someone is giving you investment advice, whether it's a financial advisor or someone on TV, TikTok, or around the water cooler at work, and you don't understand it, do your own research before making any money moves. Don't blindly trust the truth of what other people are saying, financial experts or otherwise. You're the only one looking out 100% for your own interests. Everyone else, they have their own interests in mind as well. By tuning out the noise, it'll make it much easier to employ the next characteristic of successful investors. Emotions are the enemy of making good investing decisions, and all successful investors remain calm in the middle of storms. When your investments start to drop because of global conflict, world events, or changing economic factors, many people sell. This causes more people to start acting crazy and even more people sell. And that's because of an extremely powerful emotion called fear. Fear can make grown women cower like babies in the presence of a tiny, harmless rodent like a mouse. It can make adult men cry hysterically at the thought of getting a tiny needle in their juiced up biceps. And it can cause usually smart people to intentionally lose money. Wait, what? Intentionally? Yes. In short, fear makes people act irrationally. In other words, dumb. By selling when a stock is low, you guarantee that you will lose money. Then when that stock goes up in value, they hear all the positive buzz and buy again. What they've done is just buy high and sell low. The exact opposite of what you should do. But if you've invested in a diverse group of stocks over the long term using the index funds we just talked about, you have no need to rely on your emotions to make any decisions with your money. That's because over time, the market will go up. This is because the economy always grows and expands over long periods of time. 
and so do stocks as a group. And if you have a simple plan to invest your money and you stick with it, you'll be set up to succeed like the investing greats. That's why in addition to setting your asset allocation, you need to automate your investment purchases. And when you set up automatic investment purchases every month, you don't even need to think about your investments in your day-to-day -day life. By harnessing the power of automation, you'll avoid falling victim to making foolish emotional investing decisions. And you can take advantage of compounding and dollar cost averaging to put your investments on hyperspeed autopilot by making sure you never forget to invest. Dollar cost averaging is fancy financial speak for a strategy investors use where they invest a set amount of money into the same investment like an index fund or an ETF every month at regular intervals. Regardless of whether the market is up or down, you always invest. For example, you might invest $100 into an index mutual fund on the first day of every month. Now, it doesn't matter how much you invest when using dollar cost averaging. What's important is that you do invest and that you do it every month. Now, dollar cost averaging has several benefits. You don't have to wait to save up a large lump sum of money to invest. You can invest a little bit at a time, sometimes as little as just $25. This can help to harness the power of compound interest without having to wait as you're saving up. Not only that, but you'll also lower your overall cost for every share that you own. Now this is one of my favorite features of dollar cost averaging. Because you'll invest every month, there'll be many months where you're buying when shares are up. So this means that you'll be able to buy just a few shares. Some months though, you'll buy when the stock is down, which means you'll purchase way more shares. But over the long term, what happens is that the average price you'll pay for each share will be lower than if you'd waited and tried to time the market. Now keep in mind what we just discussed, that people actually usually sell low because of fear and buy high because of enthusiasm from buzz. And this causes the average share that people pay to be more expensive. Not only that, but you'll avoid feeling the need to worry about what the market is doing. With dollar cost averaging, you can basically ignore anything that's happening in the market. You don't have to follow stocks or watch the financial news. You know that every month you're going to invest the same amount in the same thing, regardless of how it's doing. That's because you're buying the entire stock market when you own an index fund. And you know that it's always going to go up over the long term. Next up, savvy investors take taxes out of the equation. Okay, so you may not be able to take taxes entirely out of the equation, but there are a few things you can do to set up your investments to minimize how much money the tax man will try to take from you. One of the simplest is by using an account to hold your investments that take advantage of tax breaks. And while there are several of these accounts, two of the most popular are the 401k and the Roth IRA. Now for my Canadian friends, the RRSP is similar to the 401k and the TFSA is similar to the Roth IRA. The 401k is an employer-sponsored retirement account that can hold stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and other investments. And even though it's sponsored by your employer, you own the assets inside of it. Now, 401ks are great because you contribute whatever you decide, up to a maximum of $20,500 in 2022 if you're under 50, and your employer will contribute a certain amount up to a maximum as well. With a traditional 401k, money is invested before taxes and it isn't taxed until it's taken out. So when the owner makes a withdrawal of that money, which has never been taxed, it will be taxed as part of your regular income. Now because of this, 401ks are referred to as tax deferred accounts. So since you won't be taking this out generally until you're retired and making less money, the taxes you pay are much lower. And because the money you invest isn't taxed until it's withdrawn, your contributions are tax deductible, which means you can use them to reduce how much tax you pay in the year you contributed. With the Roth IRA, on the other hand, the money you contribute is after tax dollars. That means you've already paid tax on it, so you don't get a tax deduction to pay less tax when you contribute. However, and this is the best part about Roth IRAs, when you withdraw your money, both your principal and the growth is tax free. That's right. Completely tax free, including all growth from your investment gains. And with contribution limits of up to $6,000 a year in 2022, 
When partnered with a 401k, these two accounts are a fantastic way for savvy investors to minimize the money they need to hand over to the tax man. Another cost suck that successful investors avoid are high fees. Now, fees are part of the cost of owning investments. They go to pay the broker, the fund manager, and the financial advisor who sold the investments to you. Now, you can't predict how an investment will do in the future, but you can control how much you'll pay for it. In fact, fees are by far the most important factor when it comes to investing that's actually within your control. Now, why is it so important? Well, the average person looks at the fees on a typical mutual fund, say 1.5%, and thinks, hey, 1.5%, that's a small number, shouldn't affect my returns too much, no big deal. Successful investors, however, know how to do math. They understand that even though the fees that are charged on investments like mutual funds may seem low, they can eat away at the total money you can make over the long term, like a pack of hungry teenagers devouring a pizza party. Now, don't think 1.5% can make a big difference. Check out this chart. For each half a percent you can shave off your fees, you'll save around $60,000 over 30 years. And the difference between a mutual fund with a 2.5% fee and one with a half a percent fee is almost $300,000. That's some serious cash. So be sure that you minimize the one thing that is fully within your control fees. Becoming a successful investor isn't nearly as hard as most people make it sound. You don't need to be some crazy stock market wizard or have a movie made about you. You just need to be, well, in a word, kind of boring. But there's nothing boring about my next video where I'll show you how to get great deals on anything. I'll see you there.